Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship's online worship again. Uh, today we are going to continue our series from 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 to 18. Uh, the title of this message is called Transformed from Glory to Glory. Uh, and so before we go into the text, let's pray and then we will ask God for his blessings and um, uh, invite his Holy Spirit to speak to us. Thank you, Father, for uh, bringing your church, allowing us to gather online. I thank you, Father, for um, your people that are watching across the world and here in Tokyo. I pray that your spirit would bring our attention toward Christ and his saving work. I pray, Father, for renewal to happen in our hearts as we have our eyes peeled to your scriptures and that we would be changed uh, into the likeness of Christ as your spirit points us to Jesus. I thank you so much, Father, for all that you are going to do. So I pray now that you would hide me and that you would show Christ and that um, uh, you would give us the change that is so necessary in our hearts, in our minds, in our lives, uh, so that we may live for you and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, as we pick up from verses 7 to 18, uh, here's a question for us to consider. Uh, how do people change? Uh, is Christianity mainly about seeking outward behavioral change? How do we make progress in the Christian life? Uh, so follow along as we seek to answer that question by looking into three main insights from this passage. Number one, uh, the unfading glory that exceeds the past. Number two, the veil that Jesus has removed for us. Number three, the glory of Christ that transforms us. Let me repeat that. The unfading glory that exceeds the past, the veil that Jesus has removed for us, the glory of Christ that transforms us. Number one, the unfading glory that exceeds the past. Verse seven. Now, if the ministry of death carved in letters of stone came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory, which was being brought to an end. Verse 8, will not the ministry of the Spirit have even more glory? Verse 9, for if there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness must far exceed it in glory. Verse 10, indeed in this case what once had glory has come to have no glory at all because of the glory that surpasses it. Verse 11, for if what was being brought to an end came with glory, much more will what is permanent have glory. Notice Paul uses the word glory ten times here, and two more times down in verse 18. Uh, he says there is a lesser glory and a greater glory. Uh, the word glory used here means a state of being bright, radiant, or magnificent. Uh, it means a splendor of God's presence. And so he says that the old covenant glory was fading because the new covenant surpasses it in glory. Uh, now, if you are watching this and you are new to Christianity and unfamiliar with the background, uh, when Paul says that the ministry of death is carved in letters of stone in verse 17, sorry, verse 7, he is talking about God's law. He is talking about Moses' time in Israel's history when God gave his law for the second time because Israel had failed to obey his laws. If you read uh, Exodus 34, 29 to 35, uh, you will see there that Moses had gone up to Mount Sinai to meet with God. Uh, but before Moses could come down from the mountain with God's law, the Israelites had broken their promise and worshipped a golden calf made by themselves. 
basically, that's what sin is, right? Uh, sin is uh, loving golden calves, uh, a God of our own making, uh, more than loving God himself. Uh, idolatry in the Bible is loving other things, even good things, like our morality, our careers, our reputation, success, possessions, even romance and achievements, more than God himself. Idolatry is a failure to worship God as God and worshiping lesser things in the place of God. Uh, it's a pursuit of self-glory above God's glory, and it leads to empty glory. And so Paul says here that God's law came with such glory that the Israelites could not gaze at Moses' face because of its glory. Uh, the law was so great and holy that it brought condemnation and death on the Israelites who could not keep the law even for a day. Uh, this is why Paul says God's glory was shining so brightly from Moses' face that people were afraid to come near or even look at Moses' face. We see that in Exodus 34, 30. 30. Uh, see, the law as given by Moses only brought condemnation and uh, death because the law was not capable of giving life. And notice again uh, that Paul is not saying that the law is bad or that it was weak, uh, as many are tempted to assume or misunderstand. The law is holy as it was given by God through Moses. Uh, it is perfect. Uh, remember that the, the false teachers in Corinth were bringing a legalistic religion and even boasted in their Jewish, Jewish ancestry in chapter 11. And so this was the context in which Paul brought this up, right? Uh, so Paul says here, even though the old covenant had such glory, it was being brought to an end. Uh, notice what he says. Uh, the ministry of the Spirit is greater in glory than the ministry that brought death in verses 7 and 8. And in verse 9, he says, The ministry that brings righteousness is greater in glory than the ministry that brings condemnation. And in verse 11, see, he says, The ministry which lasts is greater in glory than that which was fading away. Uh, as you are watching this, here's a question for you. Have you been discouraged because of past and present sins or failures? Uh, are you struggling with habitual sins that are just hard to overcome? Are you struggling with the guilt of not measuring up and feeling powerless over sin? Are you finding it hard to obey God from the heart? If that is you, there's great news here. Paul says in verse 9, If there was glory in the ministry of condemnation, the ministry of righteousness in the new covenant must far exceed it in glory. Under the new covenant, see, there is no death, no condemnation, but righteousness and life in the Spirit for you. Uh, what once had glory had have come to have no glory at all because a greater glory has arrived in Jesus Christ. Uh, see, like a candle uh, before the sun, uh, the old covenant pales in comparison to the new covenant of, covenant of grace. See, Jesus has come to receive the condemnation that we deserved in order that we might receive the righteousness we did not deserve. Jesus has come to fulfill the law we could not fulfill, so that the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us, as Romans 8 says. Jesus has come to measure up for us in every way before God. Incredible, right? Jesus received the ministry of death he didn't deserve, so that we might receive the life we didn't deserve. And so next we see the veil that Jesus has removed for us. Verse 12, since we have such a hope, we are very bold, 13, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Verse 14, but their minds were hardened, for to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, because only through Christ is it taken away. Verse 15, 
Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. 16. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Paul says in verses 12 and 13, Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses who put a veil over his face. Now, why did Moses put a veil over his face? Back in Exodus 34, 33, when Moses finished speaking to Israel with his uncovered face, right, uh, he would uh, wear the veil again. Uh, until he went in to speak with God. Uh, see, according to Paul, Moses allowed the people to see the glory of God reflected on his face, but he denied them from seeing the glory fade away. Paul says it was so that the Israelite, Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. Moses could cover his face so that the uh, would cover his face so that the Israelites would not be able to gaze at the end of his facial glory. Uh, it's a bit like when we were in elementary school. Uh, since we were not able to appreciate complicated mathematics, the teachers denied us algebra, right? Uh, meaning that Moses covered his face because his ministry was temporary. And he showed the Israelites only what they could take in at that time. And notice, there was something deeper happening in the hearts. Uh, Paul says in verse 14, But their minds were hardened. For to this day, to this day, even as we speak, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. Paul says that there is a veil in their hearts that remains unlifted. Uh, the word hardened here is passive. Uh, it means to make the heart dull, to grow hard, uh, to become callous or unwilling to learn. It can mean an unteachable heart through layers and layers of unbelief. See, Paul says a veil of hardness had covered the hearts of Israel. They were unable to appreciate the things of God, much less obey His laws. So how do you know, uh, as you're watching this, how do you know whether or not you have a hardened mind? See, uh, one of the ways uh, to know uh, is that your heart is dull to the things of God. Uh, when you read the scriptures, do you find it dull and boring? Uh, is there no desire to read? See, if there is nothing about God that amazes you, there may be hardening in the mind. Uh, Paul says here, For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted. And he says the same in verse 15, Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. The irony is, even though the Bible at the time, Moses' law, even though the Bible was read a, a weekly on Sabbath day, the people's heart remained hardened. He says, the veil remains unlifted, and to this day a veil lies over their hearts. They are still in the dark about the new covenant of grace. In other words, see, there was spiritual blindness in their minds, and when they read the law of Moses, they could not see any light of God's glory. Uh, they could not make sense of the spiritual meaning. Their hearts were, uh, needed to be regenerated. Uh, so even today, the Jews cannot see the fading glory of Moses' law as pointing to new life under God's grace in the new covenant. See, Paul is saying that you can be lost, blind, and dull even if you are in a religious community. Uh, I remember how growing up in a Christian family, I could not appreciate anything my grandmother read from the scriptures. Uh, my grandmother used to lead us into family prayer meetings every day, uh, almost every day, as long as I remember. Um, my mind was hardened to layers of unbelief. Even though I sat there listening to the scriptures at our family prayer meetings, I could not get the spiritual sense. It would not penetrate in here. The problem was not with God's scriptures, the law is perfect, but the problem was my heart, my imperfect sinful heart and hardened heart. 
um, I was a Christian by name only and I was spiritually blind and hardened in my heart uh, until one day uh, the Spirit of God lifted the veil and I began to taste and see the glory of Christ uh, see, uh, Paul says in verse 14, the veil remains unlifted because only true Christ it is taken away. It is true Christ that the veil is lifted, right? It is only true Christ that hardened minds become softened. It is only true Christ a new heart is given. It is only true Christ that our dull hearts become alive to the things of God. Paul says, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts, verse 16. But when one turns, turns to the Lord, the veil is removed, he says. In other words, see, the veil of unbelief that covers the heart is removed when we turn to Christ. When we look to Christ away from ourselves and when we see the glory of Christ, not just know Christ at the level of the intellect, no, not, with the, not just with the knowing of our minds, but with knowing of our hearts, the seeing of our hearts, the seeing of His glory. That's what uh, Paul is talking about here. In fact, do you remember what Luke 23, 45 says? Uh, right before Jesus breathed his last on the cross, it says, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. See, Jesus has made access to God possible as he took our condemnation. By his work on the cross, Jesus has lifted the veil in our hearts. And we can now see His glory by entering into His presence. This is why Paul says, such is the boldness that we have, unlike Moses. Unlike Moses, the glory of the new covenant ministry is not veiled, but revealed in Jesus Christ. Only through Christ is the veil taken away. And when one turns to the Lord, when one turns to Christ, when you turn to Christ, the veil is removed. Because Jesus has taken the veil away, we can now turn to Him and enter into God's glorious presence with boldness, without the fear of being struck down. <laughs> uh, if you're new to Christianity, uh, you too can turn to Christ today. Because Jesus has lifted the veil that was blinding us from seeing Him. Uh, as that song, Amazing Grace, famously says, I was blind, but now I see. But now I see. We see with new eyes. So Moses' law could not change the hardened hearts and attitudes. But in Christ, the Holy Spirit regenerates our hearts and turns us to Christ and he brings the glorious power of Jesus to transform us from one degree of glory to another that's what Paul says and so finally we see the glory of Christ that transforms us verse 17 now the Lord is a spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is there is freedom verse 18 and we all with unveiled face there you see beholding it means seeing the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Uh, notice how in verse 17 Paul says the Lord is the Spirit. He says the Lord is the Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not a force but a person. He is a Spirit. The Holy Spirit here represents Christ and He unveils our face to see Christ. Notice carefully, He is called the Spirit of the Lord. He, see, the way you know the Holy Spirit is at work in your heart is that your desire to see Christ and His glory increases. It doesn't decrease. The one test of truth uh, the way to test whether the Holy Spirit is, is at work in your own heart is to see if your desire to see and know Christ increases. Um, and Paul says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Uh, see, today modern people uh, think that freedom means uh, uh, the freedom to do whatever they want. 
so they become a slave to their own choices and options. We have the right to do whatever we want, but not everything we want to do is Christ-honoring, right? See, the word freedom here does not mean license to sin. Grace under the new covenant is not license to sin. Grace is not freedom to sin, but uh, it's a freedom from sin. See? Um, it, grace is not the freedom to live as you please. It's the freedom to live as the Lord pleases. Very different dynamic. That's how the Spirit uh, liberates our hearts. Uh, rather, Paul says here that when the, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Freedom from the power and dominion of sin. Sin will no longer have dominion over you. You, won't, you will no longer be a slave to sin. That's the language. Uh, freedom from dutiful and powerless religion. That's what it means. Legalism is dutiful and powerless religion. Under the new covenant, there is freedom from legalism. Uh, there's freedom from self-righteousness. Freedom from condemnation. Freedom from fear of death. Death has been defeated. Freedom to see the glory of Christ and live to please Him. Uh, it's also the freedom to gladly obey Christ from the heart because under the new covenant we have received the new heart that Jeremiah promised. It is a freedom of direct access into the presence of God. So true freedom is freedom to finally gaze to finally gaze upon the glory of Christ and love and serve and resemble Him. See, when Moses entered God's presence, he would remove his veil and put it back uh, uh, on as he came out in Exodus 34, verse 34. His face was glowing for a moment, uh, but that glory faded, right? Uh, in the new covenant, however, however, look, uh, the Spirit of Christ has removed the veil in our hearts, right? Moses needed to put a veil over his face, but our veil was removed for us. Moses had a veiled face, but our faces are unveiled. <laughs> this is what Paul says in verse 18. And we all with unveiled face, with unveiled face, beholding, seeing the glory of the Lord. We were made to see glory, grandeur, beauty, not look at little things or lesser things, lesser glorious things, but the glory of Christ. It means all of us reflect the glory of Christ with uncovered faces as in a mirror. Uh, this is an ever-increasing glory. Uh, Moses had to go up the mountain to speak with God. But we don't have to go up any mountain to speak with God. Uh, the God of the universe, the God of Moses, has come down to us in Jesus Christ. And even today, many world religions still try to reach God by climbing a mountain of religious rules and rituals. But God has already come down to us in Jesus Christ. He has removed the veil that separates us from His presence, right? There is no gap between us anymore. This is why I asked in the beginning, how do we change? How do Christians make progress? And Paul answers that and says, We all with unveiled face, reflecting as in a mirror, the glory of Christ, are being, present continuous tense, are being transformed into the same image. Uh, do you see the word transformed here? That's where we get the word metamorphosis uh, in the English language, right? It means to transfigure, uh, to change into another form. Uh, see, the word transfigure is used in Jesus' transfiguration in Mark 9, 2-8 as well. Uh, and the focus there is on outward change that comes from inward change. A change that comes from the inside out, not the outside in. It means the core of who you are is being changed inside out. How so? Take a look at this. See, this word metamorphosis is used to talk about uh, the process a caterpillar goes to to become a butterfly. Can you imagine this? Imagine this with me for a moment. 
my wife has lemon trees on our balcony and very often we find the larvae transformed into a beautiful butterfly uh, the wormy creepy crawly insect gradually turns or morphs into a beautiful and mature butterfly and takes off amazing right and that's a picture of freedom the freedom that we gradually experience right uh, uh, so Paul says that we are uh, we all with uncovered faces reflecting the glory of Christ as in a mirror are being transformed morphed changed into another form into the image of Christ uh, this is the gradual progress by which sinners change into the image of Christ. And that change comes by looking at the glory of Christ, by fixating at the glory of Christ. Not just know Christ in the sense of, okay, I know that, I know that Shinzo Abe is the Prime Minister of Japan. Who knows that Shinzo Abe is the Prime Minister of Japan better than anyone else? Well, his wife, his family who live close to him, his colleagues who work with him every day who are close to him, not somebody like me who reads about him in the newspaper. And so to see Christ, the glory of Christ is what we were made for. And the change that we experience comes by looking at the glory of Christ, not by looking at self. Not by looking at self, but looking at Christ, away from ourselves, increasingly to Christ. Incredible, right? No one can remain the same. Uh, see, we become what we worship. We become like who or what we worship. If we worship computer screens, even our social skills decrease. We become like what we worship. Uh, we were living in sin, see, wormy, filthy, unworthy before God, but God saves us by grace, and His grace transforms us into beautiful Christ-likeness from the inside out. The Holy Spirit is beautifying you, beautifying us together as a church to conform us into the image of Christ. All of the internal bitterness, all of the lust, all of the greed, all of the pride, all of the selfish ambitions and idolatrous desires in our hearts are being transformed daily as we see the glory of Christ. The light of Christ transforms us. Look, Jesus' appearance was changed and shone with great brightness on the Mount of Transfiguration. And that's a picture of what we are becoming by His grace. You are gradually growing outwardly as the Spirit uh, removes the veils of your heart every day. You are gradually glowing, transforming inside out as the Spirit removes the veils of your hearts every day. Paul uses the same word in Romans 12 verse 2 where he said, be transformed, same word, by what? By the renewal of your thinking, of your thought life, your old patterns of thinking. Uh, in other words, even your thought life is being set free by the Spirit to meditate upon the beauty of Christ until your heart is lifted up by His glory, grandeur, and beauty, and thereby you become like Him. Finally, as I close, notice how Paul says, we all with unveiled face. This is not an individualistic project. Transformation is a community experience. It is a we all experience. We all with unveiled face, Paul says, are being transformed into the same image, into Christ's image, Together, Transformation happens in a community where God's Spirit is at work in our lives together. Transformation is happening when we all pick up the scriptures to read and see the glory of Christ together. Every time you hear a tug or a nudge in your heart, even a small impression in your heart to pick up the scriptures and pray, that is from the Spirit of God, from the Holy Spirit. Uh, transformation is happening when we all gather to worship God together, when we all pick up the scriptures to see the glory of Christ together, uh, even if it is online now, 
and when we all gather to study the scriptures together uh, and when we all gather to pray together uh, we are being transformed and when we all serve one another with our eyes fixed on the glory of Christ, transformation is happening in the community. That is how we make progress and grow in grace together. So Paul says we are being transformed from one degree of glory to another. It's from one degree of glory to another. That's what the Spirit of God is doing in your life. Do not despair. Embrace this call today to follow Christ and let the Spirit of Christ open your hearts. Allow Him to open your hearts as you pick up the Word, the Word of grace, the means of grace, the Word of God and prayer. Our church this year, we said, is going to be immersed in the Scriptures and in prayer and in community. And so do not neglect these uh, means of grace so that the Spirit of God will use these things to really conform you into the image of Christ uh, and he says for this for this for means because this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit this transformation comes from the Lord who is the Spirit the completion of your sanctification does not depend on your power but upon the Spirit's power transformation comes by seeing the glory of Christ the Spirit is at work in your life the Spirit is transforming us together in community from one degree of glory to another another to an ever increasing glory until we see Jesus face to face and become fully like him let us close in prayer father we thank you for your word of grace we thank you that your spirit is present here to point us to the finished work of Jesus, but also to the ongoing work that you are doing in our hearts. Spirit of God, we invite you to lift the veils of our hearts. Any remaining darkness in our hearts, we pray that the light of the glory of Christ will shine in there so that we are more and more becoming like him and that we reflect that glory as your image bearers we were made for this to see the glory of the resurrected christ and to reflect his glory and i thank you father that those who are watching today do not need to be in despair for sins that they are struggling with because there is power in the finished work of Jesus. There is hope beyond this world as the Spirit of grace is transforming us into His image. That we are not left alone to finish this sanctification in our own power. But we thank you that you have given us your Spirit who is the helper and also the Word of grace, the Scriptures and your community and the sacraments to grow in grace. I thank you, Father, for your people and your faithfulness towards them. I pray that every day as we wake up, may we gently uh, respond, willingly respond to the gentle wooing of the Holy Spirit to open up the scriptures and linger in your presence. And as, may we as a community immerse ourselves in the scriptures as we gather in Bible study groups and in our prayer immersion uh, community group as well. I thank you for all that you're going to do in and through the Bridge Fellowship and those who are watching across the world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.